revealing yourself to us more and more as we push deeper into you, wanting to know you better, wanting to know you more, wanting to know your will. Lord, we also take a moment to pray for all the people that are still recovering down in Florida. It's going to be years of recovery. Lord, can't imagine what it would be like to lose everything that you've worked for all your life in a moment of time. Lord, we just pray that you'll reveal yourself to these people in such a way that they will find comfort in you, Lord God, help in you, new life in you, Lord God, and give them courage. We ask you to bless. And we also pray, Lord, we're not going to wait till the last minute to pray about this. We're going to start already asking you to form in people's hearts how they're going to vote in a few weeks, that, Lord God, we would get a reprieve. I don't know that anything can stop what's happening, Lord God, because I believe it's your will, but it's also your will that we pray. It may be, Lord, that this is a very intense labor pain and there's going to be a little bit of brief time of some uh, uh, time to relax, I, but I don't know. All I know, Lord, is we pray that you give us good government. You pray that we give, you, give us men and women who fear only you, and, Lord, that you would remove the evil from us. Lord, that you would turn this nation around, that, Father God, there would be a true revival that sweeps through this nation. And for many, it won't even be a revival. It will be a resurrection because they're already dead. And, Lord, they, they, they need to start from scratch and know you. So, Lord, we have a big job ahead of us. The children of God, we are the ones that are holding everything together by your grace, by your will. We are the ones that are going to have to be taken out of the way for final things to happen. Lord, we want to be ready for that day, but we also don't want to get lost in it. We want to get lost in the fact that we have a job to do. We have a gospel to preach. We have people to save. Lord, there isn't a one of us in this room that isn't praying for your salvation to come to children and grandchildren. And Lord, we also pray as we ask you to save our children that we also can do everything we can to save yours. Use us, Lord God, for your glory. Prepare our hearts. Pre prepare us to be better ministers of your word by teaching us today more things about your gospel than perhaps we've known as we lay a foundation of Christ in our lives upon which many things can be built. So, Lord, we just yield to you. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amy, if you would at some point, because, again, I don't want to wait till the last minute. I don't know if they might have a ballot online yet or not, a Missouri ballot, if we can come up with that so we can start maybe discussing a couple things as that happens. Appreciate that. In our studies today, we're starting again with a page that says, No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I think I've identified the page that you're missing, and I'll get that to you. And then I've given you, I don't know how far we're going to get today. That's why I kind of work ahead. And uh, it just depends. But anyway, this is coming from, well, of course, we're, we're going through 1 Corinthians right now. Again, we are just doing that as a, uh, I don't know how many scriptures we're going to end up with, but if we were reading all of, all of Corinthians, it is 437 verses but we're probably picking another 50, 60 or so that we think are foundational. All are important, every one of them, uh, as, as we grow in grace. This is a magnificent statement. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And we, of course, give a mental assent to that. It's like, oh, I know that. I've heard that a long time ago. I'm aware of that, okay? But do we really understand what this is saying? Is that, is that you can't teach anybody that Jesus is Lord. You can demonstrate it in your own life by making him Lord of your life and so on. But it, really what it's saying is no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by revelation. What is revelation? We use that word a lot, don't we? Revelation knowledge. It's knowledge that doesn't come from a human source. It is knowledge that is only imparted through a divine being, the Holy Spirit. It is truth that can only be told to us by God. And the neat thing about it, on the one hand, is we have a lot of people that don't believe in Christianity. We have a lot of people that wage war, if you will, against Christianity. They're critics of what you and I believe. But the answer we have for them is always, you know, somebody said it this way. If you're a critic of the gospel, is you have an argument. But I don't have an argument. I have a revelation. And I have a revelation that's backed by an experience. And you can't take that away from me. Once you've had a revelation of God, once, once that door has been opened, once that thing is opened in your mind, opened in your heart, opened in your spirit, there's no going back. There's no going back. And so that's why when we pray, we pray that there will be this revelation. We had, you have an argument, but we have a revelation backed by an experience. And that's something that you just can't argue against. 
You can't argue against my experience unless, unless you see the change. I mean, I, I, I wish you see so many of these men that have gone from being murderers and, and rapists and child molesters and all these other things to just loving Jesus with all their heart. Uh, it is amazing when you hear the prisoners themselves get up there and make this statement, this is the best thing that ever happened to me because here is where I found Christ. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And that didn't come because somebody was teaching. It came through. Now, the Holy Spirit will take that teaching, but unless the Holy Spirit makes it real, you could preach for five solid hours to them. If the Holy Spirit isn't making it real to them, it's just going to bounce right off because they have no receptacle for spiritual things. The Bible says that, the, that spiritual things are uh, foolishness to the unbeliever. He just, and he doesn't have the receptacle. He's sensual. If you remember that, unbelievers are sensual. What does that mean? It means that they do everything by their senses, what they see, what they taste, what they smell, what they touch. This is how they operate. And the spiritual, spiritual things don't work in that realm. They work in the spirit realm of the inner man. And once you've had this revelation and experience, you are, you are good to go. So we just never want to forget that no one can say Jesus is Lord and, and mean it that he is Lord, that he is the curios, that he is the most high, that he is the most sovereign, that he is the most powerful, except by the Holy Spirit. There are people that might give a mental assent by that but haven't had the revelation of it. Unless you've had the revelation of it, it is not going to change your life. I tell you the worst... You know, you know who the most pitiful person is in the world? Is the person who's sitting in church trying to be a, bo- a Christian but has never been born again. The person who's just playing church. The person who just, you know, wants to come to church and clock their time. Uh, doesn't mean anything to them because, again, they're sensual. And now the next one, two, three, four verses on this page all really come together at, 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 uh, for the same kind of meaning, if you will, here. They, they, they are all supportive of each other. You know, it's amazing after, I have hard to add it up, but I guess off and on I've been in this for about 40 years, preaching, teaching. I don't know how many thousands of teachings I've done over the years. Uh, I know it's literally in the tens of, probably about, about 10,000, uh, I would believe. But what I'm getting at is there's always something new to learn. You'd, always, you'd, you'd kind of think after 40 years of working at something that you'd be pretty much have mastered it, you know. It doesn't work that way. God is always showing new things. You know, there's always more to the Word of God. And there are things that you learn and you move on, and then there are those times where God sets up camp. That's an expression I use many times is we're going to camp on this a while. And the reason we're not going to just look at it briefly and move on is because God wants us to camp on this for a while. And that theme, as I've been telling you, I I hope you're grasping the importance of it. It sounds so simple. It sounds so easily to understand, and yet most people are failing in it, okay? And that, again, is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It's not just external to internal, but it is also the fact that we go from corporate to individual. I mean, this is something that, and you say, well, what does that really mean? It means that so many Christians that should be having a one-on-one relationship with God are still going through their church and the corporate body to have a relationship with God, and God says, no, I want you. If it were not so, God would have made the corporate church the body of Christ in the sense of the temple of God. But every one of us is an individual temple of God. Every one of us is an individual priest to God. And every one of us is an individual sacrifice to God. And yet most people don't do that. They stick with the corporate because it's safer. We know we just, we just let the church kind of handle it. We pray when they say pray. We sing when they say sing. And we listen while they preach. But in our own personal lives and our own relationship with God. I mean, if, if your only relationship with God is what you do on a Sunday morning, God help you. He wants a personal, and it, look at, and, and if you don't realize that, we'll read these verses and not see it. It's kind of like the bond slave. Boy, when God hit me with this, what's it been now? Two years that I've been talking about the bond slave? I lose track of time. But once you have that revelation that everyone is either a bond slave of Jesus Christ or they are none of His, because you're refusing to take up your cross, your responsibility, your calling, and walk with God. And Jesus, said, Jesus didn't, his, his altar calls were different than the altar calls we have today. Today's kind of like, join the club. We're one big happy family. Jesus says, no, come to me and die. Lose your own desires and your purposes and pick up mine, and I'll take care of you in every way because if you put the kingdom of God first, I'll make sure there's food on the table, health in your bodies, and whatever you need. 
because you work for me. You're mine. You've given yourself to me. And so I can concentrate on the things of the kingdom. So this idea of individual, an individual relationship with God, it sounds so simple. It sounds like well, that's, not, that's not a startling revelation, yet it is a startling revelation. Because so many people don't move into it. This is why I get so fed up with Christianity that only takes us to the cross. You really start to understand that the cross is the open door for all these other things to happen. I'm not downplaying the cross. The cross is fundamental. You've got to go through that door of the cross. You've got to come to the cross first. But you don't camp there. You camp in your relationship with God. That, that, that crucifixion happens so that we can have a relationship with God. And we can only have a relationship with a holy God is by Him making us holy in His Son. Everything that God has done is to have a private relationship with Him. So what does that mean? That means in ways that we can't understand. We don't know what it is to live outside of the boundaries of time. We like to think with all the multitudes that are going to be in heaven, how is God going to take time to have an individual time with me and an individual time with you? There will be a lot of corporate things that happen. Not that corporate things all end. Corporate things are great, but it's no substitute for the individual belief. In fact, God uses the individual for the good of the corporate. He doesn't use the corporate for the good of the individual. There's a big difference there. Because you look at this next one, we, and we're not going to get into this particularly, but if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, this is where he's beginning to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. And I don't want to spend time on that right now. I want to look at the way this is, that, that this is here to, to, to point us in the right direction. He says, and this is the second one, we've already said no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. But now we come into these next four that support each other. He says, the manifestation of the Spirit is, to give, is given to each one for the profit of all. Look at what it just says. The manifestation of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit are the manifestation or the reality of the, re, of the reality of the Holy Spirit. Your gift, your gift, your gift, your gift, your gift, my gift, together. Every one of our giftings as we move in them is a reality of the Holy Spirit because they are not gifts that are natural to us. They are supernaturally given. And the anointing, and this, this again, was a, I shared this with Ben. What a, what a revelation God gave me a few weeks ago. I've never heard him say this before. I've never said it before. The, re, the anointing of God is not on the person. The anointing of God is on the gift. But we always talk about it being on the person. Oh, he's so anointed. It's the gift. That's why Paul says, be careful. He says, this is why I keep my body, my sinful flesh under control. And I'm led by the Spirit. He says, because I don't want to find out that when I've preached to you that I myself am disqualified. And all these men I work with on Monday night who feel a call to ministry, I shared with them, it's one of the most dangerous scriptures in the Bible. But it really goes for all of us. Because what that says is that there, there are people that are having altar calls and success in their ministries, but they themselves at the end of the day will go to hell. And people wonder and they say, well, you know, if, if you've ever looked at a ministry and you know in your heart of hearts that there's something wrong with it, there's something not right about this, there's something that's like God, you know, and yet it just seems like God is blessing, 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 and they have big crowds and everything else. But don't take that for granted. The, the point is, the anointing is on the gift, and then the gifts of God are of non-repent. See, it's dangerous when God says, I'm not going to take my gift back. What I give to you, I give to you. And I give it to you individually. This isn't the corporate church of, of deliverance. This isn't the corporate church of word of knowledge. This isn't, you know, it's given to the individual for the corporation, for the profit of all of us. But it is a dangerous thing because, because if God would withdraw the anointing, if God would withdraw the gift, if God said tomorrow, Skip, you're not a teacher anymore, I'm taking that anointing from you, it would shock me. It would shock me. Because I can't do it without Him. I can't teach my way out of a paper bag without Him. I have grieved Him at times, and I know when He's not there, when He's quiet, when He doesn't say anything, you can bottle it for sleeping pills. But it's a dangerous thing to know that, the, think about what I'm saying, it's a dangerous thing to know that the gifts that God give you for the benefit of the kingdom of God, He will never take them back. They are of non-repent, the Bible says. 
So because the, the gift isn't taken from you, you don't get a warning that, hey, you better get your life together. There are some very, probably very popular ministries. I mean, let's look at it right now. With one-third of all, all senior pastors, one-third of all senior pastors believe there's more than one way to God than Jesus Christ. One-third of senior pastors surveyed in the United States. And yet, I tell you what, I have watched stuff on television. I have watched people from different services, you know, and uh, Anglican and different, different ones. I'm thinking of one Anglican right now that teaches that, you know, that, that, that Jesus isn't really a real person, that he is in all of creation in the Big Bang. It, it just blew Jesus to pieces all over the universe. And you can find Jesus everywhere in the rocks and this and that. And, you know, that he did not walk on this earth as an individual man doing all these different things. And it was just all hogwash. It was all blasphemy. And yet the church is rich and full and streaming over with people. I can't explain it. But the dangerous thing is just because the gift is staying anointed and, is, and God won't take it back doesn't mean that you won't pay the final price. That's what Paul said. He said, I keep my body under control. He said, I make it my slave so that at the end of the day I don't find out that I have been disqualified. And so there are ministers out there that are disqualified. They're dis in, the, in the account of God, they're disqualified. They're not preaching the truth. One third of pastors don't believe in the virgin birth. And yet they're, they're, their churches flourish. I can't explain it. But I know one thing. Just because their anointing is there doesn't mean that they're not in trouble. Because you've got to take it serious. You, you, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the, the anointing of the gift that God has blessed us with, let's keep it holy, let's keep it pure, let's use it in the right way that it can be used. So look at what this says again with the idea of individualism. The manifestation of the Spirit, this revealing of the Spirit, is given to each one. Say it again. The revelation of the Spirit is given to each one. There's, that's individual. That's God giving those gifts through the uh, through the. Uh, power of the Holy Spirit, imparting them to the believer, to the individual believer for the profit of all. We don't, like I say, we don't become the church of deliverance. We don't become the church of, of uh, the word of knowledge. You may have people that walk in those giftings in your church, but that is given to them individualistically. And you will answer individually. You're not going to answer corporately. You're not going to stand in a crowd before Jesus when he analyzes what you've done with the gifts he's given you. And we all are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not because of salvation. Not, that's not the issue. The issue is, what have we done? It's supposed to be a good time of reward. It's supposed to be a good time in which Jesus will say, what have you done with the giftings that I gave you? And he's going to say it to you individually. It's not going to be to this church or this group of people. He's going to, you know, I, I, don't, I, I think this is where so many people are missing it. There's going to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And as I started to say earlier, we'll, we'll be teeming with believers in heaven and angels are part of that company of the family of God. And yet there will be time for us. We might spend 10,000, what would be the equivalent, 10,000 years in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Father. He may just invite you to come up, sit on his lap on the throne like a little child and just talk with him. And you think, well, he doesn't have time for that. There's 100 million people out there in the plaza waiting to come into the throne room and talk to God. We're not subject to time anymore. I like what one guy said talking about prophetically about heaven. He says, he says, you realize we can eat all we want. We can eat for 500 days in a row and never put on a pound. That sounded good to me. So let's say it again. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It's individual. We go on to the next one. The Spirit works all things. He's the power behind all the gifts. The Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. We're back to the individual. The point I was going to say about the bond slave is, once you come to a revelation, once God camps there for a while, because he doesn't want you just blowing past this. Oh yeah, I read that. No, but do you understand it? Have you implemented it? What does this mean to you? Do you really understand? Because I guarantee you, if you're not offering yourself to God every morning as his bond slave, I've failed you. Because it's, it's, it's not an elective. 
It's a requirement. Jesus said, those who won't pick up their cross and come after him. Come after him how? As a bond slave. Everything Jesus did was as the bond slave to the Father. Read it in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus comes making himself a servant, making himself a bond slave to the Father. And the, and the truth is that will never change. You've got to understand it in the Greek words. More, 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 not metamorphous, but metamorpho. That he takes on this, this character. It's, it's not an office. There isn't the office of the slave. You, you're, 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 not, you're not asking to be elected to be a, 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 a bond slave to Jesus. It's what you become. It's what you change into. It's what you morph into. And the Bible says as long as you live, you will always have that office. You will always have that nature. So what it's saying is, is the Jesus that you and I will know in heaven is the same Jesus we know on this earth. And Jesus, when we get to heaven, will still be a bond slave to the Father. And we will still be bond slaves to him. Because it isn't an office. It isn't like, oh, that's needed now on earth, but we won't need it when heaven is established. Not at all. Because of the meaning of the word is it is a change of character that is permanent. It is something you will always do because it is something you will always be. Oh, somebody ought to be saying amen right now. So we begin to understand. So once you camp on that, now, every time I read the scriptures, I see the bond slave appear here and appear there. Where if you're not thinking bond slave, you, you, you won't associate it with it. But when you're, when you're focused on that truth, that that is our relationship with God, things that you'll read in the, in the scriptures that you haven't seen that way before, the, the light will shine and you realize that's talking about a bond slave. That's what a bond slave would do. That's what a bond slave would say. That's how a bond slave would pray. And you see it because you camped out there. And you learned it. And that's just with the way this is with this individualism. There's a lot of people that are going to just slough off this teaching. That's not important to me. It better be important to you. Because I'm telling you the relationship that your father wants with you and what his son died for that you can have. How do you think God feels when he gave up his only son, gave him over to us, gave him over to death, gave him over to that hideous death, it's amazing, they, with all our technology, they had a thing on YouTube the other day about the three most hideous ways to die. I didn't read it, but it's interesting that the crucif crucifixion was still right there at the top. For all our technology and all the ways we've learned to hurt people in this world, it's an art of hurting people. You go back and you look at things that came out of the Middle Ages and things they designed, the Iron Maidens and, you know, different, different horrendous things that they did, and yet... Nobody's thought of a more horrendous pain than the cross. And so God puts his son through that, allows that to happen. He gives him over. I was sharing this morning in the class that uh, we read about how Jesus was delivered up for us all. That's an interesting phrase, delivered up. The be a better way to, to translate it is to say the word surrender. It would be like Jesus is holed up in here. And we're all here defending Jesus because we know those people out there want to kill Jesus. And all of a sudden the father walks in and he takes Jesus by the hand and he takes him outside and surrenders him to the crowd. He says, do with him what you're going to do with him. But that's exactly what happened. He surrendered his son up to very, uh, to, wherever, to everyone who was an enemy. There was no, no friends of God at that point. The Bible says, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. And Jesus is surrendered by the Father. He's delivered up to them for us all. And so when you, you look at the investment that God made, I always, I always like to use that term ROI. It's a common economic term, return on investment. You know, you're not going to... I think of Frank and farming. You know, when do you decide that a new tractor is warranted? When is that... When, what is the return on that investment? Are you going to get more done, more crops? And, you know, is it going to produce more income for the family to make that investment into that tool or that machine or whatever? You know, it, it's like when I was doing the woodworking, you know, do you, do you want to spend $4,000 for a big planer, you know, or a big sanding outfit or something? And the question you have to ask is, what is the return on my investment? I'm going to spend $4,000 for that big, 
uh, sander, you know, am I going to get better quality? Am I going to be able to produce more product? You know, how does it affect my profit on the bottom line by the investment? Now, all I'm saying is, is God has made an investment with his son. And the return on that investment is he wants a relationship with you individually. So much so that he made you the temple, made you the priesthood, and made you the sacrifice. So that you have to come singly by yourself. You're not going to come before God with a group. You're not going to say, come on guys, I don't want to go by myself. You go with me. No, God says, eh, I want you. And it's not a harsh thing. He loves us. What parent doesn't want to spend time with their child? And he set it up that we could. And we don't. We think corporately. God's thinking individually. The next one, same thing. God has set the members, the members of the body of Christ, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as he pleased. Look at what that's saying. God has set the members, each one of them. He doesn't do anything as a group. He does it individually for the profit of the group. He sets them in the body as he pleases. You're not here because you decided to be here or in the, wherever you are in life right now, you are here because this is what God has ordained for you. He has set you in the body as it has pleased Him. And then you look at the next one that really tops it off. It says, it says now you are the body of Christ and members individually. How, how much clearer does it have to be? You are the body of Christ. We are the corporate body of Christ and members individually. Why didn't, he, why didn't the Holy Spirit just say, you're the body of Christ? He could have stopped right there. You're the body of Christ. But he does. He says, you're the body of Christ and members individually. God's looking at us individually. He's not looking at a corporate. He's looking at an individual believer. He knows you intimately. He knows the very hairs of your head. He knows the date of your death. He knows your thoughts are far off, David said. In other words, God knows if I'm still alive five years from now, God knows exactly what I'm going to say, what I'm going to think, what I'm going to do on that day. He's already there. He knows us afar off. It doesn't mean he's far off and, and kind of like looking at us at a distance. It means that he knows far off everything about us because he's individual. Jesus didn't say, well, when a flock of sparrows hit the ground without your father's permission, he said, no, a, a, a single sparrow will not hit the ground, but what your father knows it and what it had to be in his will. So we have this individual relationship with God. I made this statement. Let me get my glasses on here. I made this statement. Corporate worship is good. We had corporate worship here today. But it is never a substitute for individual worship. Individual worship is not only what you say or what you sing. It is what you bring. Corporate worship individual worship rather, is not only what you say, not only what you sing, but what you bring. Because singly he has made you again. I can't repeat it enough. He's made you the temple. Know ye not that your body is the holy of holies of God. Know ye not that you have been made a royal priesthood. Know ye not that you, have, you should bring yourself as a living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable in his sight. How many of you do this? Ask yourself. How often did you present yourself to God this week? Did you just pray with your want list? Or did you do what he said to do? Did you come into his holy presence individually, one-on-one, -on -one, just you and God? And did you bring him yourself? Did you come as his priest? Did you come in his holy temple, which is body you are? And did you bring him the sacrifice of yourself, holy and acceptable to God? If, we, if, if this is where Christianity is at, that we just come to God with our prayer list, and we're not presenting ourselves to God on a daily basis as his priesthood, as his children, individually. What are we here for? You know, saying that something is prophetic doesn't mean it necessarily always tells the future. Sometimes prophetic means telling it the way it is. A.W. Tozer, in his book, The Pursuit of God, 
I think he nailed this, and I think this was a prophetic statement. Because I, I'm wondering, you know, I have to kind of guess sometimes on Monday nights who I'm talking to. I've talked to you guys for years now. I kind of know what you know. You don't know what you got on tonight when I go in there. We're running out of chairs. There's more people than there are chairs coming in. And they've got their little rules and everything. Well, you can't put a chair past this line because it's too close to the lockers. You've got nothing but you can do but, but set all the chairs up along the lockers because there's no place to put all these guys. God's bringing them, you know, but you don't know what they know. But most of them have come from, if any religion, it's always through this corporate revelation rather than this individual revelation. And when you think about it, what I just told you today should make you sad. It should make your heart sad for the heart of God that he's not getting the time with his children that he made the investment in so that it could happen. This is how A.W. Tozer said it. Listen to this. First thing he says is, God waits to be wanted. Oh, that's powerful. God waits to be wanted. He forces himself on no one. He waits to be loved. He waits to be wanted. He says, God waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us, he waits so long so very long in vain. At the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push into a conscious awareness of his presence. Let me repeat that again. That's deep. God waits to be wanted. Too bad with many of us, he waits so long, so very long in vain. Never happens. What we're talking about never happens. And God waits. God himself, waiting for his redeemed children, the, he, the ones he bought, to push into a conscious awareness of his presence and how few ever get there. How many people do you think really walk around with a conscious awareness of the presence of God? Is God your best friend? Is God your buddy? Is God, is God everything to you? Honestly, I've come to the point I don't even believe in set-aside corporate time of worship. I'm not talking about my own. I'm not saying that right. What I mean is my worship has become so simplistic. My prayer life has become so simplistic. I don't think God's into long prayers and big words, but he's into a constant relationship. In fact, on most of the times when I pray in the morning, I do have prayers that I pray. Pray for all of you to pass under the rod of God's love. I can't begin to list to God everything that you need. I don't know what you need or what you need or what Jane needs or what Scott needs, what you guys need. I might have some ideas, but, you know, it's bigger than that. But God knows everything, so you just pray, Lord, before you release them into the pastures of your will, cause them to pass under the rod. David said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me because that's what the, the, what the shepherd laid across the gate, and he made each individual lamb go through there and as each individual lamb went underneath that rod he looked at them and he smiled at them and he sang over them and he brings whatever they need and that's how I pray for you guys every single morning but I don't say amen because my talking to God never stops oh God did you see that Oh, I almost forgot to take the trash out. They're coming today. Thank you, Father. You, you reminded me of that. I mean, it's into everything. I'm to the point now I've got to have reading glasses all the time. I did good up till now, but now I've got to have reading glasses. I, I, and I will admit, personal information, TMI, too much information. I like to read on the pot because I don't get enough time to read all the things. So I'll take Reader's Digest or something else. I have to take my glasses. And so I'll set my glasses off to the side while I'm going to the bathroom, after I'm, I'm reading, I don't want to waste that time. And I'll leave the bathroom, and all of a sudden he'll say, you forgot your glasses, because I left them there. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. God talking with us back and forth to the little things, to the big things. to He's everything. And when we say amen, it doesn't mean the end anyway. Of course, it just simply means it, it will happen. It, it, it shall be so. It's an affirmation of faith. 
But God wants us in that individual walk with him. Not going to church, not, not cracking open the hymnal because there's preset. We will pray in the Lutheran church. We will pray for the sick. And it was always the same prayer, you know, paragraph this, page this, and we would all read it responsively or together or the pastor would just read it. I still remember the first time I went to a storefront church and I still remember when a lady got up and she said, she was praying and she prayed for that service and her first words were, Father God. I had never in 24 or 25 years of my life ever heard anybody call God Father in a prayer. There's a relationship that he wants with us. I want to read this one more time. God waits to be wanted. Too bad that with many of us he waits so long, so very long, in vain. At the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push into the conscious awareness of his presence. That wraps up where we were. Now you've got new sheets. And of course we're going into the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which is the love chapter, if you will, you know. And uh, I'll say this to you, because I think, I think I'd rather, I don't want to really want to start that today. I don't want to just begin it and then end it. I'd rather come back to it, okay? I'd rather let you go 10 minutes early, okay? Um, but remember this. This is what you want you to think about as we start going into that. People will say that 1 Corinthians 13 is the greatest uh, analysis, uh, writing, if you will, about love. It's the greatest description in the world of what love is that's ever been penned but you'll also find it is the greatest description of God ever given to the church other than Jesus Christ. Because you have to understand, what does the Bible say in John chapter 4? God is love. God is love. So everything that we read about what God, what love does or doesn't do is God does or doesn't do. And you will get an insight as we go into this about the character of God like you've never had before. It's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Let's pray together. Father, I would rather take something small and just devour it, assimilate it, than do a whole lot of things that we forget. Lord, let us all leave here today with this engrafted into our hearts that you expect and have the right to expect an individual relationship with each of us. Let us never substitute the corporate for the individual. Forgive us, O oh God, if we have done that. Forgive us, O oh God, if we're not presenting ourselves to you every morning and saying, here we are. In fact, it's even more individual than that. It's here I am. Send me. Send me. O oh God, May you be getting some return on your investment in our lives. You invested your son into us individually. And you have placed us in him individually. So that we could have that relationship with you. Not that you are harsh. Not that you're trying to speak words of judgment. You just want to tell us how much you love us. And spend time with your kids. Abba. Oh, God, let us learn to give ourselves to you. You've been waiting. You've been waiting to be wanted. Oh, Lord, cause us to willing to do your good pleasure, to come before you, to give ourselves to you, to pick up the mantle of the bond slave, and to do your will every day of our lives, and to have that oneness and completeness with you that nothing, take the place of. No corporate worship, no corporate organization, no corporate church can take the place of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. So thank you. We give ourselves to you. And we tell you, Father, we love you. Corporately and individually. We love you. 
and seek to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, beloved.